reload this real quick. Okay, so we're going to continue talking about um, classes in C++. So uh, last class we talked about how we kind of go and define that class. Um, if you remember correctly, uh, let me pull up Visual Studio. We oops. Um, <clears throat> we had our class definition. We had made them all all the uh, methods and data types were all public. Um, we're going to talk about why that's a bad thing today. I mentioned this a bad thing that we'll get to it later on, but we were starting off simple and adding little bits of complexity as we went along. <clears throat> so we're going to get into that today. Um, we have our constructors. We have a get area. Uh, this is actually all in the book. If you've gone through the book in chapter nine, you can see this type of stuff. Um, and then we had, uh, I added a get diameter just to show an, an additional method that you could use. Um, then we have in here, we had our, our main function, uh, and we had a couple of things going on uh, as far as we print out the circles, uh, radius and their area and stuff like that. But there was an issue, <coughs> excuse me, was an issue I had um, with if we did it pass a parameter into a constructor. So last class, you might remember I had this, and this caused an error putting those parentheses. So uh, I figured out what my error was. I was thinking, unfortunately, C sharp, not C plus um, plus. In C sharp, you have to always give it parentheses when you create a new class. It's done a little bit differently, but I was mangling those two languages together because the very next class I teach after this one, uh, we use C sharp in it. So. Um, I just apparently got my mind set on that and, and went down the rabbit hole. Um, so when I had a chance to kind of stop and step back and went, oh, that's right. No parentheses if you want to create an object with the default constructor. So all I said was circle, circle three, uh, which is kind of like defining a uh, variable. You know, if I say int you know, temperature, I just define them, and I don't, if I don't say equals such and such. Um, but with a class, when I define it, because I'm creating uh, that object that I have to go through that constructor, you always wind up declaring an object. You never just define it, you always declare it. It always has all your methods that you need, you always have any default values you set, and it's always just ready for you to go. And if I do this um, and run my file now, you're going to see it's going to come up and it's going to say, okay, the circle's radius is 7.2, then the area is, it goes down this whole process. We have here the race of five, uh, one's a little bit different, but that's the anonymous object. Uh, and then here's the one with the default uh, constructor. Uh, something that's called the no arg constructor, which we didn't pass any arguments into it. Uh, and it has the default value of 3.5 of a radius, which gives it the area of 38.4845. So I just wanted to, to make sure you had a chance to see that. Um, that way it's, you know, no one's lost on it or anything like that. We figure out I had uh, solved that problem. I just, like I said, kind of went down a rabbit hole. Uh, with another similar language. So uh, just want to keep you apprised of, we figured out how to fix that. Alrighty, uh, back here. Okay, so we talked about creating the object in the constructors, of course, and now we want to talk about separating the definition from the implementation of the class. You might go, what on earth does that mean? Um, in fact, when I read the, the little section heading in the chapter, I kind of went, what do they talk about when they phrase it that way? It's a little bit of an odd phrasing, and that's okay. Um, but the idea is most projects, especially nowadays, are not written by a single individual. There are exceptions. Um, there's always exceptions to, to that rule. But most of the time, people are working in teams. Uh, the team might be two people, the team might be 200 people. 
uh, you, you just never know how big that team's going to be. Well, if you have a single CPP file, you can't have 200 people simultaneously editing it, editing it. What would happen is you would have one person editing it and 199 people waiting their turn. Um, that's not really efficient. So we need to break this up into separate files that different people can work on. Object-oriented programming makes this very easy because I can say, all right, uh, you know, Andrew, you've, you've got this file, and James, you've got this class in, in that file that I want you to work on. And Annie, you've got this class I want you to work on. We can just kind of go down the whole process. Hunter, you got this one, I'll take this one. And when you get done editing one file or making modifications to that class, that file, uh, then you maybe go into uh, the project management tool that you are using uh, or you go to your project manager or, or whoever it is and they say, okay, now I need you to work on this class and here's the file that you're going to do for that. And so it allows us to have a lot of people starting to work on one big project and we can all be working simultaneously. We don't have to wait for other people necessarily. The way we're going to do that, though, is we have to remove that class that we built. And remember, previously, the class is just up here in the, the top of my main file. We need to take this class and move it into its own separate file. And we need to separate out that content. And the way we do it is actually we're going to create two files. One is going to be something called the header file. And the header file is actually up here where we have these includes. A lot of times what we're actually including is a header file. And that's just going to give us like all of our function definitions. In this case, it's going to give us our class definition. Okay, so if you remember our, our function prototypes that we had before. Well, we're going to basically create that for a class. That way, I can include it and then my main file knows what it's supposed to do. The compiler, when we go through the compilation process, we talked about how it's going to uh, compile all the uh, pertinent uh, sections of, of files and all the separate source files and stuff like that. <clears throat> and then it's going to link them together. And we talked about the linking stage in your compiler. That's where this actually comes into play. And we're going to actually see this today how it's going to link those data files together for us to create one executable at the end. Okay, um, so that's what we're going to be working on doing. I'm going to show you guys how to do this both in Visual Studio as well as in the online editor that I've um, suggested to some of you to use in case you don't have Visual Studio, you can't get installed on your machine. Um, or you're using like a Chromebook or something like that, and you can't go with it, so you use an online editor. So I'm going to show you both methods, um, and then we, we can kind of go forward with that, that process. So let's show you how we're going to do that. The first thing I'm going to do is I need to minimize my list so we can see this. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is I need to add a new set of files, the class files, to my Visual Studio process. So I'm going to do that first, and then I'll show you in the online editor, uh, which would work also if you're using something like um, a text editor and, and doing command line operations and stuff like that. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click in this kind of this little blank area over here. And about 40% of the way through my list, there is an add. It's a little fly out menu. And I'm going to choose to add a class. Now, when I add a class, uh, it's going to ask me for some information. Now, this is actually going to give me a little bit of an error. I'm going to show you how we're going to fix this real quick. So if I say circle, okay, notice here's my two files it's going to add. My .h file, which is my header file. And notice it gives you a little pop-up hint that says, hey, if you go and you know, this file isn't created, we're going to create it for you if it doesn't exist. And it's got a CPP file. This is where the actual source code is going to go. Uh, once again, if it doesn't exist, it'll go and create it. It has some other things for you to know about, such as uh, if there's a base class that you can um, 
access, how to do that, how to use inline options, etc. I'm not gonna worry about that. If I click OK, it's gonna say, well, hold on, class circles already implemented this product project. Okay, notice class circle over here. So it's gonna give me a little bit of an error. Okay. You don't have to worry about that. We're gonna go in and fix that in just a second. Okay, so I'm just gonna hit cancel real quick. And oops. I'm going to select this whole section, save it, okay? I selected it, I cut it, that way I can go back and add it back in. All right, right click, add class, circle, click OK, and now it works, all right? So nice and easy. It opens up for us, if you look up here in the top, it opens circle.h. You might say, well, where is circle.h? Well, if I look in my solution explorer off to my right hand side, I have a header file. And my header file includes circle.h. Okay. It's going to create the class name uh, with the braces and the semicolon for me. That's more than I need. So I'm going to come in here and select that, delete it, and just paste in my header file information. Save that real quick. Okay, now my header file should only have my method prototypes for my class. So it's going to define my class, it's going to define my attributes, it's going to find my um, class prototype information, but it should not define my actual functions. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you this real quick, and come over here and copy. I'm going to go in my circle.cpp file. I'm going to double click on that to open it. Notice it even has some source code in it automatically. It says we're going to need to include circle.h. Okay, so it's including circle.h. This is how it's going to know what methods are in the class that it's going to be referencing. So I have to include that. Okay, I'm going to just paste this in here. And you notice that goes, whoa, I don't know what you're talking about. This has errors, okay? So it actually has a couple different errors. It's gonna say, well, wait a second. Uh, this is the same name as a class. That's a problem, you can't, you can't name functions the same name as a class. Uh, it's talking about a variable called radius, which doesn't exist, and it's all confused about that. Um, it's gonna be confused about the fact that this function doesn't return a data type. And it shouldn't because it's a constructor but it doesn't know that. We have to let it know that this is referencing our circle class. And this is a method of our circle class. So the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna specify circle, colon, colon. Now, this is saying that we're referencing our class circle, and this is our constructor called circle. So now we don't have to worry about the other information, you know, like return types, it doesn't matter. Constructors don't get a return type. We don't have to worry about how do we define radius. It goes, oh, I'm part of the class circle. One of my uh, attributes, one of my properties is radius, so that's okay. So we took care of all those little errors. We just need to go through this whole process. What I'm gonna do just to simplify this, I'll show you how to simplify it real quick. I'm going to select my second constructor all the way down. Come down here. Now paste them in. Now select circle colon colon. Notice it does have two colons. I copy that. I come in here in front of my, my method names. And I paste it in. Remember, this goes in front of the method name, not in front of a return type. So here where I have get area, and I have get parameter. In both of those cases, I have uh, a return type because it's a function. It doesn't matter if it's void or if it's an actual return type. I need to put the, the class name, colon, colon, in front of my method name. When I do that, notice all my errors go away. I'm good as far as that goes. I'm going to save this real quick. Inside of my header file, I'm going to go back to that. And I need to remove my function bodies and replace it with just a semicolon. Because remember, these are 
method prototypes, not the actual method. Okay, so I'm just going to come here, do that, do that, do that. Okay, I'm done. That's all I had to do. Very, very simple. Okay, if I go and run this file now. Okay, I go try to run this file, I get an error. Why do I have this error? So, let's talk about the one step that we missed in here, and we'll, I'm going to give you a hint. I have up here, I have my include circle H, and notice what is not up here in my include statements. If you said you're missing your circle.h, you are correct. Okay, so just because a class is part of a project doesn't mean it automatically gets imported. We have to tell C++, you need to import this file. Okay, so the way we do it is we just say pound include. And instead of saying angle brackets, because we're not pulling something that comes from C++, this is something we wrote ourselves. So I'm going to say circle. And notice it actually gives me a list because it knows my header files here from this folder, okay? Now, if I go to run this file, boom, it runs, okay? So we have to declare the header file so we know what's being brought in, what's being referenced, stuff like that. Our classes generally have the same name for the header file in the C++ source file. It's just the extension that's gonna change. .h for header, .cpp for the source code file. And that's how we kind of separate out a class from our main source file and how we write the information so we can use it in other files. And that's the other key important thing is because we've written this as a class and it's a separate file, if you were to come along and say, hey, I need this again, you can come into this project and just reference that or import this project into your solution and you can reference a class that's already been built. Um, this becomes a very efficient process for writing code. And one of the key components of modern software design is not writing any more than we absolutely have to. So a lot of times libraries or classes like this are written and provided by third parties that we can just reference. Um, Sometimes it'll be like, and give you a perfect example. Uh, I had a situation where I was doing some credit card processing. The credit card processor had a whole library that made it easy to connect and communicate with their servers. And in connecting and communicating with their servers, I was then able to go, oh, here we go, and reference and use that information. So very important uh, process when we start building larger and larger projects. That library file probably got used throughout dozens and dozens of applications, um, but it only had to be written by one group of people one time. It was a third party. I didn't have to worry about it. Um, likewise, when I was working uh, my last major job, and it was just two of us developers, but we put everything in a, a shared project. And then if I wrote something for uh, an entity that he needed to use, it was right there ready for him. And vice versa, if he wrote something I could go in and reference it and use it uh, and start sharing that information back and forth so it became very efficient for us to work. Um, there's no need for me to recreate a process that my coworker already did. That That's kind of silly. So it was a huge uh, improvement in our own performance as far as you know how many projects we were able to get done and whatnot uh, just by reusing what we had available to us. Okay. So that is the process of um, separating out your definition for your implementation. Uh, we talked about the header file and what that looks like. I give you an example of that there. And then uh, there's a source code. Uh, you can see how that's all separated out and whatnot there. Okay. Uh, then finally, we have the main file that you can see there. So each one of those little pieces, uh, you can see in the notes how they get separated out into three separate sections if you want to go and, and need to reference that again. 
um, very good process. So let's talk about how would we do that for the online editor. So let me come over here to the online editor. I have here a main.cpp. Uh, if you're not familiar with this one, uh, that's okay. If you are, then that's great as well. Um, this was just a, a free online C++ editor that we found. It works actually pretty well. I've been impressed with it um, <clears throat> in most things. But then I started wondering, it's like, wait a second. How would this work if I didn't have multiple files? Um, you know, I was able to do a class in the main file and whatnot. That was fine. But how do I add a second file? I don't have a solution explorer off to my right-hand side. So what I found is up here, there is a little new file document. And if you click on that, it's going to ask you for the name. And so I can say circle.h. And that's my header file. And then just for sake of brevity, I'm going to come over here and copy my header file, paste paste that in, okay? And then I need another file, my circle.ppp file. And once again, just for sake of brevity, I'm going to copy and paste that in. And then just like with Visual Studio, I need to go over and add my include for my circle.h file inside of my main.cpp. Now, if I go and run this, this is obviously a very simple example. I don't have all the other aspects. It goes and takes them in to compile, but you'll get the message down at the bottom. This is what our area is. So it's 38.4845, whatever the unit is. Okay, And that's how it's going to work. So you can do this, you just have to go in and create a new file. Um, the process of what you put in there is exactly the same. You, you need your header file that you're gonna include, and your header file is going to have all of your method uh, defin uh, prototypes, to my, my method prototypes, and then you're gonna have your circle.cpp file, which is going to have all of your class methods in it. So very simple, very easy. Um, for me, it was just copy and paste. Uh, you will notice it doesn't do all the color coding in your additional files that it does here, um, but that's okay. We, we can work with that. Um, so, but I, I want to make sure for those of you who are needing to use this um, tool that you have this ability. It's not something you have to pay to get like an add on or anything like that. It's just really available. I do not know uh, if there is a limit to how many classes you can create uh, using this methodology. I've not tried it. I've not found any documentation. Um, I've just gone through what I have here. So um, there is probably some sort of limitation. I'm just not aware of it yet. If you create a file that you do not need for some reason, you, you make a mistake, you maybe you misnamed it and you want to go back in and fix that. Uh, if you click on where you have the little dots, uh, <clears throat> you'll see it comes out with a little drop-down menu. Uh, it says rename, so you can change name and fix it if you misspelled something, or you can delete it to remove that file out of the little online process. So you have two options there, whichever works best for you, you can Excuse me. Uh, whichever works best for you, whichever you need to do, you can use that's built right in there for you. Uh, so you uh, don't worry about, oh, I went and made a mistake, and now what am I ever am I going to do? You can just use that process. You're okay. All right. So that was separating your definition from your implementation. Uh, now we want to talk about uh, your data field encapsulation. Um, this is going to be kind of similar to the next part we're going to talk about as well. Uh, but we want to talk about this because it's a real important concept. We want to make sure that you are uh, comfortable with. So 
one of the things that we've seen is our property radius is part of the public classification. And what that means, if, if I have a field or a method that's public, is anyone can go in and access this. You do not have to have any type of special permission. Um, you do not have to have uh, any constraints. I can go in and directly access this. And let's show you an example of that and why it might be a problem. Okay, so I've got three circles here, circles one, two, and three. I've given a default value for two of them, or I've given a starting value for two of them, and I'm using a default value. You can see here I say circle one dot radius, and because it's a property, I just say dot radius, and it gives me the value. The problem with that is I can come over here and say circle two dot radius equals 33.4 and it's also going to work I, I can turn around and also come over here and say circle three dot radius equals negative five and 33.4 might be a valid radius that i need to update and change but at what point can i have a negative radius that sounds like it's going to cause a problem Okay, so if I'm going to run this, it's still going to run. It it says, "Hey, numbers are numbers," and ta-da, rock on, dude. But clearly, there's going to be an issue with that negative radius. So we got to find a a good way to fix that, and that's what the data encapsulation is designed to do. It's going to encapsulate or protect my data so that another developer can't just access and make a change. Is that negative five could be uh, an accident. It, it could have meant to be a positive five, and someone just slipped. Um, that 33.4 might not be valid. It might be too big. I don't know. You know, i got to have my own rules to, to work with and play with. But how do I do that? Okay, so it's real simple how we're going to do this, actually. Come back to my source code, and I'll show you. Okay, so instead of having radius up here in the public, we're going to give it a security method or property called private. And private simply means that you can't see this unless you are the class itself. So if I have a method inside my class, I can talk about radius all day long. But if you are not inside of my class, that doesn't mean that you don't have access to my class. It's just if you're not one of its members itself, if you do not belong to a class, you cannot see radius. It's like it doesn't exist. You might say, well, how do I get the area without radius? Well, you don't have to worry about that. The class is going to handle it for you. And this way, I might call my, my property radius, I might call it R, I might call it Bob. It doesn't matter as long as my class knows what's going on. And that's the important thing. It's the class that needs to know what's going on. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to circle that H. I'm going to type in private. And there's my double radius. If I save this, I'm going to show you what's going to happen if we go to run this. In fact, you don't even have to run it. It's going to automatically find that this is an issue. It looks and says, wait a second, there's a member, circle radius, as declarer, but I can't access it. Okay? It's inaccessible. It means I cannot access that data. It's hidden from me. But that's good. That's what we want. Okay. We don't want them to be able to directly access. Now, we need to have them be able to get access to that information. So, how would we do that? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. I'm going to come into my circle.h and I'm going to create a public method that's going to allow them to get the radius. And I'm going to actually call this a getter method. 
A getter method is often called that because we usually start with the word get and then we simply use the variable name. So I'm going to say double get radius. I don't have to pass any parameters to this. Now, in some cases, I will, but I don't have to. If I have this get radius, you're going to find that our definition for this method is not found. We just have a prototype, and that's okay. I can come in here to my class file. Oops, my class file here. Double. Remember, we got to get my class name, colon, colon. Get radius. Notice it knows that that function is supposed to exist, and so it pops up. And I can say return radius, just like that. Now what I'm going to need to do is inside of my intro to C++ file, or whatever you might have called it, instead of saying radius, I need to say get radius. Now it's a method, so I have to use my open and close parentheses. Anytime I need to get the value of radius, I can simply do that. Just change out the, the property name with my new method name. <clears throat> and you might go, well, what did that really buy me? I can just get radius all day long. That's all it's doing. In fact, I remember from my discussion about functions earlier, that anytime I make a function call, there's a slight performance hit. So I'm getting a slight performance hit by doing it this way. So why would I want to? Well, this comes back to setting the value and getting potentially bogus values, like a negative five. You can't have a radius that's negative. That just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I can't make something read accessible, but not right accessible. I have to be one or the, I can either be accessible or inaccessible. So I'm going to create a setter class that's going to allow me to set it. Once again, come to my header file first. In this case, it's going to be void because I don't return anything when I set a value. Set radius, double new radius. This hasn't been constructed yet. Okay. So I can kind of go over here and see some issues. I can come back to my circle.cpp file. In this case, it's going to be void. Circle colon colon. Set radius. With the value I'm going to pass in. And then I'm going to use an if statement and say something like if new radius is greater than zero. Radius equals new radius. Now if I go and run this file, let me save them all, run it. Oh, forgot one step. I'm still trying to declare the value directly. I need to say set radius. Yeah. Oops. Set radius like that. So this way, instead of calling the radius directly, I have to call that method set radius. And now it works. And you'll notice that <clears throat> you may remember when I set my radius to negative five, it came and said the circle's radius is negative five, then the area is, and it was the same area, area as if it was positive five. And that's because we take the radius and we square it. Any value squared is always positive. So it kind of fooled itself into thinking it was right, but it wasn't. In this case, it went and said, oh, wait a second, negative five? No, I don't think so. Because that if statement wasn't true, we're able to take out bogus data. So we don't know what was 
wrong. You know, should have been 95 and they just slipped on the keyboard. Um, should have been negative five, should have been positive five. Who knows? So by using a setter, we were able to go in and look for something and go, wait a second, let's fix this. I don't think that's quite right. If I want to, I could come in here and do something also like uh, if new radius is less than 20, This way, if I have a raise that's too big, it also won't work. So it's got to be greater than zero, but less than 20. Um, I just did this with a nested if statement. I could have used my Boolean logic with my and statements. Uh, that would have worked as well. So here, instead of going um, 12 point, instead of turning that 12.3 into uh, 30.4, it kept it as 12.3 because it was greater than 20 units. Likewise, we're still ignoring the negative five and we're keeping its units to 3.5 just to be safe. So using that set radius gives me a lot more control. I got to use the getter in order to be able to use the setter though. That's just one of the downsides. I could have had a public method or excuse me, a public property with the public methods, but then people are just going to try and directly access that data and that's never a good idea. So this is generally how we're going to process something using getters and setters. Now there is one other type of setter I do want you to be aware of and that's if you're using the type of bool for boolean data types. Usually instead of saying get in a value in the variable name because if you notice everything in here when we have a get or a set it's get or set and then the variable name. But if we have a Boolean data type for a variable, then a lot of times what's going to happen is we'll use an is. So I might have a uh, property called secure. I want to know if, if my information is secure, if I'm using an HTTPS uh, process or something like that. So I'll say is secure. It's a Boolean value, yes or no. Uh, and I can have lots of these different types of things. And so just saying is something just makes it a little bit easier to read, especially when we put inside an if statement, because it's going to return a Boolean value. It makes it very logical to do something like that. So that's our getters and setters, which is what we use to be able to access private data inside of a class. Now, just to let you know, there are more types than just private and public. There's a couple more types, and other languages will sometimes use slightly different names. Um, we're not going to get into those at this point. It's not really relevant. Uh, we only need to know about public and private, and to be honest, that's what's mostly used. Um, so just, you know, as far as that goes, just kind of keep that in mind. All right, if you want to know more about your getters and your setters, it's available inside your, your um notes file called data field encapsulation. You have a whole section here, getters uh, and how they get written and then your setters and how they are written, including things like dealing with uh, how do you do error checking on that. Before we, we go any further, um, just want to double check. Does anyone have any questions about this piece before I start talking about variable scope in working with uh, objects? Okay, so let's talk about uh, variable scope then. <clears throat> okay, so whenever we talk about encapsulation, it's especially for early on, it's good to have a, a quick refresher about variable scope. <clears throat> so where can I see a variable? Where can't I see a variable? If I am inside of a class and I have what we refer to as a class property or sometimes a class variable, you'll, you'll hear those names sometimes used interchangeably. And all that means is in here in my class definition, I have defined a variable. Now for our circle class, we only have that single uh, variable. 
if I have a more complex class. So um, I might have a, uh, a circle class that also has an X and a Y coordinate. So I know where to plot this on a, on a chart. I might have a class that deals with student. We talked about student classes the other day and how they would have things like for um, first name and middle name and last name and nickname and, and suffix and then your address and it would have things for like your major and expected graduation date and all those different types of things it would have listed as properties. Those would all be class level variables and they are accessible within your class. That's their scope, the whole class. So it doesn't matter what method I'm in, I can go in and access that variable directly. I don't have to call set radius or get radius. I can just directly access it because I'm inside the class. And this is just kind of, um, we're all sharing this information as all part of that uh, knowledge of our class definition. Um, even though it's in this case private. Uh, and so you might be thinking, well, how come I can access it if it's private? Well, it's all a matter of, of belonging to that inner circle, knowing that group. Uh, you, you might think of it kind of like, you know, if you ever belong to a club and you have like a secret handshake, um, everyone who is in the club knew the secret handshake. You could do it to prove that you were part of the club, but if you weren't part of the club, then you didn't know about it. It was hidden from you. Uh, at least that's the way it was supposed to be. Um, you know, so th that's kind of like the same idea. All those methods that are there, they're all belong to the same club, club, class, circle. And so they all know about all of its properties and they can access it directly. And that property exists from the time the class is constructed to the time the, cl the class is destructed or goes away. And destruction is something we've not talked about inside of our class uh, definitions yet, but there is a destructor which says that when I get rid of a class and when I destroy, destroy it, um, when I create it inside of a method, or excuse me, another function uh, or method inside of another class, and then it goes away because I don't need it anymore, all that data is lost, okay? But as long as the class object exists, that data is accessible. That's its variable scope. An object is good for from the time it's created until the end of that function that gets called. So if I'm inside my, in this case, my main function, circle one here is good until I hit return. Once I hit return, all bets are off and it's gone. But until I hit return, that circle uh, object is good for me. If I go and I have another function and I call that function from main, then circle one expires when that second function ends. So your class object exists within the uh, function that, that created it. And while that function is still being processed, as soon as it ends, then it loses its ability. Otherwise, we can treat it just like a class, or like any other variable. Um, an object is, because it's kind of treated like any other variable, its scope and what can be seen uh, all vary. So just because I have a circle inside my main function, doesn't mean if I create another function, that circle will be visible there. Not unless I pass it to that function. So that's just kind of uh, just a, a reminder of, of how variable scope works, especially within something like classes, because that is, um, it, it is a special case, but it's also not. We try to keep it as similar as possible, uh, as that makes it a little bit easier to work with. Okay, any questions on variable scope before we move on to our next section, when we talk about encapsulation uh, and abstraction? Okay, um, another way to kind of think of and just to, if it helps when we talk about encapsulation um, of, our, of our properties, think about 
yourself for a set, for example, if you had to create a person class, and I said, there's some things about you that you don't want people to, to know. Um, there's some things that you don't care who knows, okay? So for most of us, for example, we don't care if someone else knows our name, okay? So if I'm, you know, walking down the street and someone says, hey, there's Walter, I'm not going to go, shh, shh, don't tell me one, you know, that's secret information, okay? I'm not going to do that. Who cares if you know who my name, what my name is? Um, unless you're someone who's like trying to hunt me down for some reason, you know, I'm, I'm not going to care who, who knows my name. Um, on the other hand, I don't want just any old person to know what my social security number is or what my credit card number is. I'm going to hold on to that data really tightly. That information is not being publicly announced. I might go to a, a, a function, you know, at the at the school, or I might go to a trade show, and I'll wear a name tag that says, "Hello, my name is Walter." I'm not going to go to a function uh, anywhere and say, "Hello, this is my social security number. Feel free to, you know, impersonate me and steal my identity." Okay. I'm not, I'm not wearing that name tag. No one in the right mind is going to wear their name tag uh, like that. Uh, no one's going to say, here's my credit card number. Feel free to buy something off of Amazon for yourself. Okay? No one's doing that. Um, so that is, you know, if you want to think about the difference between public data and private data and what's okay to make accessible and what's not. Uh, so when I have those getters and setters, I can kind of control who's going to see that. You might think, well, why is that important? Why are we talking about that after we already kind of talked about that little piece? Well, the other part of what we're going to deal with is the class abstraction and encapsulation process. Um, so we've talked about functions as having a way to abstract our data. Um, so I can, I can use a, a simple name to call a procedure that might be a lot of steps. It might be one or two steps. It might be dozens of steps. But instead of having to go through and think of all those steps every time, I can use a function name to abstract that process. That way, I get a chance to um, write something a little bit easier. I can write things multiple times. I just write a single name. That's a lot easier to remember. Okay, especially if I named it something important, something good. It's always important to name your your functions and methods good. Okay, your class does a similar thing, except instead of abstracting out a uh, a single set of commands, I've got a set of set of commands in my methods, and I've also got a set of properties. You know, if I'm looking at, once again, let's, let's talk about like the, the class for students. And I know I need to have your, be able to print out your full name. Do I need to store your full name in there? Or do I need to store it as first, middle, last? Does it matter? Well, if that class is abstracted, as a developer who would then use that class, I don't care. However, you decided to do that, as long as it works for me and it works fast enough for me, then I should be happy. And that's the idea behind the abstraction is that I don't have to know how that data is being stored and being processed. That's the encapsulation part. What your properties are, how you store it, if you store the full name as full name, or if you break it up as middle names and you just combine them. If you don't have the individual names, first, middle, and last, you only have full name, it, you know what, it doesn't matter to me. It just matters that it works. And so that way we're, we're both abstracting information and we're encapsulating our data into separate components. That's actually a really big process and part of object-oriented programming. In fact, object-oriented programming talks about three main tenets, and the first one is data encapsulation. I should never have to know how something is stored or how something works. Let's move on to a different example of the, I don't care how something works, I just want it to work. Let's say I had uh, inside of my class students, I had 
uh, an array that stored all the classes that were taken. And in that was a function for sorting my classes. Okay, that's good so far. Let's say that you wrote this and, and you went back and remembered, oh, there was the selection sort that we wrote earlier. And so you go, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to write my selection sort, and then I can sort all the classes that a person's taken, and it just works, and we're happy. And I'm happy because it works. But as someone has taken more and more classes, this, and we got more and more people in it, this becomes slower and slower, and that's a problem. And so someone comes in behind you, or maybe it's you, you say, oh, you know, I learned about this faster sorting process. So instead of sorting by using the selection sort, I'm going to now sort it by a quick sort. Quick sort is much faster. Um, it's much uh, simpler as far as the number of steps that have to be processed. It's a little bit more complicated to actually do. It requires some recursion methodology, requires some understanding of some uh, grouping and sets, stuff like that. But it, it is much, much faster than a selection sort. And so what winds up happening is now you go in and you're looking at um, how am I going to take this information? How am I going to use it? Well, I know automatically right here, right now, uh, that if I rewrite this as a quick sort, it's still going to work. And because it's going to work, that's real important for me, because it's going to work, I can rewrite that function. And I will never have to tell you, or if you rewrite that function I'm using, you'll never have to tell me that, oh, we changed how this works. Because it should just still work when I call that sort method. And if I call that sort method, it should sort all those classes that I've taken, or you've taken, or someone else has taken, whoever uh, object we're talking about. It just does it faster. So I get a performance enhancement. I call the exact same method, and it just still works. There's actually a terminology for that process. It's called refactoring. Refactoring is, is the whole idea of I can change the way something works, but as long as my inputs are the same and my outputs are the same, it doesn't matter. Hopefully, I've found a process that's either faster, more accurate, or both. That whole refactoring process is how we can get things to be faster, smoother, easier over time. Uh, there's a well-known programming process that basically says, hey, you know what? Write your program, kind of like consider a first draft, and just make sure everything is done. And then once it's running, we can run and look at processes and see, is there a slowdown somewhere? Can we speed up that process and just refactor that? Excuse me. So that's the, that's the the process of refactoring is. I may not need to speed up a section, so who cares if it's not written the fastest way possible? But if it is and does need to be, I can go in, modify that one little piece, because my class and the data and methods within it are all abstracted to the end developer. It shouldn't matter at all. And that's a really, really powerful thing, okay? So that's the process of abstraction and the encapsulation component. Is there any questions that we all might have uh, based on anything we've covered today? Uh, we've covered the three main topics. Any, any questions on any of those things today? Okay, very good. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left to class. Um, I'm going to kind of give this time to you guys. I'll stay on if you want, uh, and we can talk about the homework assignment if there's any questions there. Um, I know there was kind of some new stuff and kind of some different stuff and deal with multidimensional arrays. It's, it's kind of a weird abstract thing. I knew when I started, I had some issues working with it. Um, but 
at the same time, the way I, I got, got over him and the way I got used to working with him was by working with him. And so that's kind of what this homework assignment was. Um, it was definitely not designed to be too difficult. If you've already got it done, great. I know at least one person has turned it. I believe I've already graded their assignment and, and got it back to them. Um, hopefully you guys are, are able to knock it out too if you haven't already. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll stick around for next, like I said, about uh, 12, 15 minutes to answer them. Uh, otherwise, you, if you're done or you don't have any questions on that, uh, you're just going to keep on working on that. You are more than free to go. Enjoy your weekend. I hope everyone stays safe. Um, and I will see you next week, if not earlier during uh, office hours and stuff like that.